here on YouTube. And my name is um, Lisa Mason Ziegler. And if we've never met before, um, I am a commercial cut flower farmer. I'm urban. I am dead in the middle of the city. And um, I am the owner of the Gardener's Workshop. And we are all about helping folks grow cut flowers at any level, whether you're a home gardener or a flower farmer. So today, you know, we're in mid-January, so we are heading into high seed starting season. So, before, so today I'm gonna to demonstrate for you, I'm actually gonna be starting some of my own seeds and you're gonna follow along. That's kind of what I do, y'all. Um, I don't do really productions um, for, for, to, to share with you guys. I just kind of carry you along with what's going on here on my urban farm. So before we jump in, I just have a couple things to stay, say. And the first thing I wanna say is, is pretty nippy here. It's um, in the 20s and I'm in Southeastern Virginia for anyone that's not familiar. Um, I'm in the Mid-Atlantic. And so I am in zone 8A slash 7B. We teeter back and forth. So it's a bit nippy out there. And I just can't tell you how incredibly exciting it was this morning for me. This is what happens to you all when, when you dig into farming and gardening like full time as your job. Um, standing out at the foot of my cool flower garden, that is um, my garden of cool season hardy annual flowers that were planted last fall that are hooped and covered. Um, they don't need it for cold protection, but there's a lot of other benefits the covers bring. Anyway, this morning, standing at the foot of the bed as the sun was lifting right above the horizon, and all of a sudden, my hoops that were shaded, you know, um, were all of a sudden had bright sunshine on it, and it just started going through my mind of just how incredible the environment is about to change underneath those row covers because our beds are covered for all of our beds that have transplants in them those beds are covered in what's called bio 360 it's a biodegradable mulch film um, it's made out of a corn byproduct and i've used it for almost a decade now and we absolutely love it because it's like a dream for us in weed prevention but it's got two sides, black side and a gray side. Well, we always put the black side up when we make those beds for fall planting because that black film on the surface of the soil in combination with hoops and row cover, lightweight row cover at that, that just creates like a little club mat underneath there, y'all. It's like, I just think of all the creatures under there, you know, pulling out their lawn chairs and getting ready to lay in the sun because it's like a little mecca underneath there. And um, anyway, so this is the craziness that goes through my mind when I'm walking my golden retriever around this farm. So welcome if we have never um, met before. I really appreciate um, folks subscribing to my YouTube channel. You can follow me on Instagram and Facebook. I'm super active on both of those. And you can post your questions down um, underneath where this is going on. And I will go back after this is ended, maybe not today, probably tomorrow, um, and answer any questions that I do not address in this actual um, live that we're going through today. So um, you can find out more about me and all we do over at thegardenersworkshop.com. Um, our specialty is we only sell the same tools, seeds, and supplies, um, as well as our online courses. Um, we only sell what I use here on my farm. Um, we sell supplies, tools, and seeds for farmers and gardeners. And um, our online courses are, um, I produce from my own, create and produce, but we also publish courses for other um, cut flower industry professionals that are like the best leaders, the best um, there are. So you can check all that out. And so let's get down to the nitty gritty of what we wanna do today. So I wanna talk about the process. I'm gonna kinda do a run through, and then I'm gonna actually make some blocks and sow some seeds with you guys watching me. Um, so this is just a quick run through. First off, we're talking about soil blocking. 
Soil blocking is the way that the Dutch and the English have done, um, started seeds for decades. This is not something that's fairly new. It's still fairly unheard of here in the States for a multitude of reasons. Um, but we, I learned how to start seeds this way 25 years ago. Um, I learned from Elliot Coleman and um, it was just the most practical, most economical, most environmentally friendly, and then the bonus, the icing on the cake, it also grows an incredibly healthy, fast little transplant. Um, so these are the tools. We still import these from England, um, from the sisters, we call them. Um, the sisters are three sisters, and there's actually a brother too, that took over this business from Mr. Ladbrook a, over a decade ago. And Mr. Ladbrook is the one that designed and made these tools years and years and years ago. Um, so these are the tools, and you can find these over at thegardenersworkshop.com. Um, and I did give up, I used to, when I did these demonstrations, actually use the original soil blocker that I bought 25 years ago. But I stopped using it because they used to be red and it totally confused people. They thought it was a whole different model. So I now use the black ones like this is what you'll get if you order one. So I wanna talk about the mix um, and you're gonna see this up close here in just a minute. Um, soil blocking does do best with a specific type of blocking mix. And it's actually the complete opposite of other seed starting mixes. Um, most seed, well, all other seed starting mixes, basically you're putting a mix into some kind of container, whether it's a cell pack or a pot or a peat pot or whatever. So those mixes are made to be really light and airy and fluffy so that air and water can move through it very, very quickly. Well, that's exactly the opposite of what you want for blocks. Blocks need a very heavy and dense mix. There is no vermic, there is no vermiculite or perlite um, in the mixes that we, the mix that we sell, or the mix that you can get the recipe off of my website. Um, that's Elliot's mix um, recipe. And um, yes, you can surely make the blocks from all those other previous mixes that I mentioned, other seed starting mixes. However, it's the long haul of the block that really is when the problems start to happen, as well as um, almost all of those mixes are actually sterile seed starting mixes. We don't use anything sterile. As organic farmers, we know that we want our soil. We want everything to be alive. Um, and so this is a compost-based mix, um, and you can find the ready-made mix on our website, thegardenersworkshop.com, but you can also always find the recipe if you wanna make it at home, which we recommend, go for it. I mean, that's what I did as a farmer because you need tons of it, right? Um, so if you go to thegardenersworkshop.com, go to the Learning Center, one of the choices on the drop down is all things soil blocking. There's a bunch of soil blocking information. Just scroll down till you find the homemade recipe. So the other part about the mix that's different than most seed starting methods is you get it really wet. The basic overall ratio is three parts of the mix, whether you make it or buy it, three parts, and I'll just show you. This is what I used this morning. You can use any container. It's three parts, three bowls of this full to one part water. So I filled this up one time and dumped it in with water after I had filled it with three um, blocking mixes. That's your jumping off point. I am a big believer in measuring because not only does it make you do it right, but it saves you so much time because I watch, I mean, I even watch the people that work for me, um, just scoop some soil in, then they have to guess how much water to put in. Um, so I'm all about measuring and it's whatever size container you wanna use, three parts blocking mix to one part water. And then here is the best mixing tool ever. Um, I tried every other gardening tool out there. I mean, trowels, all these other tools that I had in my gardening shed. Um, but I'll tell you, the potato masher is the best for mixing the water into the soil. Um, it's like mixing concrete. If you were um, a grower, like when back when I used to... Um, do this a little bit differently, like decades ago, the back break or killer way. I used to mix in a wheelbarrow and I would actually use a hoe, a long, my long handled garden hoe. Um, but 
this does the job. This is what we use all the time. And for folks that don't know what a potato masher is, you know, I'm, I'm sad for you. I have been asked that question. What is that tool? Um, so this is a potato masher. This is the way we mash potatoes before we had mixers. And you can find this typically at your local grocery shop. So I wanna look at trays right quickly. Um, <clears throat> I use many different types and sizes of trays because the size tray should fit for the number of blocks that you're starting of a specific plant, variety, and color or mix. Um, <clears throat> so let me just grab them up here. So for the average home gardener or for the flower farmer, that's not growing a ton of vegetables or the vegetable gardener that's not growing a ton of flowers, um, you always wanna have the options of small trays. And I'm sure I'm gonna get some hate messages because yes, these are foam people, but guess what? These are not disposable. We use them for years. Um, I always get nasty grams from people, but um, that is the reality. We have not found another source of any kind of tray this small that has the right characteristics. Um, so this holds 40 of the small blocks um, and this holds 60. And <clears throat> I do use the small blocker 95% of the time. I'll show, I didn't even show you the big blocker. This is the two inch blocker. I only use the two inch blocker when for in two, in, well, actually three instances. One, if the seed that I'm starting is too big to go in the small, small block, that would be basically like zucchini, sunflowers, big seed. I mean, imagine, these are the ones I've already made and sown. Imagine trying to put a zucchini seed into one of those little blocks, it isn't gonna work. So that's when I use this. The other time that I use this, is to bump up a plant from the small block to the next block. But here, notice, warning, 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 people, I do that almost never. <laughs> the only time, so let's first look at this. See those little notches? This actually comes with a choice. You get a nipple or you get, and you, you can purchase these inserts separately. The nipple on here would make a big divot in the top of a two inch block to receive a seed. But if you wanted to bump up a plant from a three quarter to this, and I, the only times that I can think of that I do that is in tomato plants and super slow growing flowers, and that would only be eucalyptus. Um, it's way too labor intensive for commercial growers to actually do that. That's part of the method, which you'll hear as we go on. Um, it's all about timing people. Um, I grow, in and plant out in the garden, the three quarter inch blocker 98% of the time. Um, <clears throat> so the two inch blocker is necessary, but I don't use it very often. And why is that? There's a whole lot of reasons, but for me, I am a small, small space farmer. I do not have any hooper greenhouses. I do everything in this building that I'm sitting in right now. I have a 10 by 10 grow room with grow racks or with racks and grow lights. And so I'm always looking to conserve space. This blocker takes 12 times the volume of soil of this blocker, and it takes up more space. Just look at the difference. This is four plants, this is 20 plants. It's a no brainer. So whenever I can get away with this, this is what I use. And I have tweaked that method over the years. Um, so this is the two inch blocker. I do use it occasionally, but not very often. So the trays. On this tray, you can fit either 40 of the small blocks or eight of the big blocks. You know, it comes really clear why you would want to figure out how to use the small blocks whenever you can possibly. So what are some of the characteristics of this tray and these trays, and you'll see on the others, they have really low sides. They will hold water, but they do not allow water to run out because I use trays with a flat bottom, no ridges, and there's no drainage holes. Um, big learning curve for people, but once you figure out the watering on this, it liberates you to grow a lot more in a much smaller space without a lot of extra work of pulling trays out of, you know, plastic cell trays out of the bottom tray and dumping the water. It's just incredibly space savvy and efficient. Um, so this holds 40, this holds 60. You can find both of these on our 
website. Now, this tray I'm getting ready to show you, um, we have already sold out of thousands of them and we're in waiting for more. You can find it on the website, not to purchase, but you can sign up to be the first to know. This is the bane of my existence. And it really, I had 50 of these um, and I was gonna be using them through the seed starting, but in fact, the girls came and got them off the farm and took them back. I hadn't opened the packages, which was my mistake. Um, so this is a tray that holds a hundred of um, blocks. So it holds five sets. Is it five or is it six? One, two, three, four, five. So this will hold a hundred blocks, which is exactly now that in my new life as a small, um, not having a production farm um, at that level anymore, this is the perfect size but they are not available. These come from England, so we never ever know when they're gonna show up. We have thousands on back order, um, but notice low sides. It's narrow enough that the blocks can be placed on one side, leaving an open well. If you're a commercial grower, this is what I use. And you can see, I use all these different size trays, y'all. People always say, well, what size tray should I get? Well, you know, there's a bunch. So these are basically what are you made for as cafeteria trays. Um, they're super expensive when you buy them new. I mean, they're like 10 or 12 bucks um, often, but you can find them used um, or online at different places. And they're two different sizes. One holds the, this one holds a few less blocks. Um, so it really depends on the volume that you need to start, but look how they have low sides. I see people online using trays with really wide sides. Doesn't seem like a problem until circulation, mold, mildew. There's just a re, you want the lowest side as possible. So let me show you my secret weapons. Here they go. All right. So <clears throat> the way that we mark trays is this. So we use painter's tape. This holds better than masking tape. I used masking tape for years, but it always ripped apart. One of my followers turned me on to this. So masking tape is the best. And we just put mat, we write on the roll. And this is our garden marker. This garden marker does not fade. I can, I'll say that to you. This garden marker will not fade. It'll come right on tape, wood, and even plastic. We used this same, you'll find that on the website. It is made to be outdoors in UV rays and moisture. Um, we used to grow a big lily program, meaning tons of lilies that had markers. So, because you sell lilies before they open. So you've got to mark them very efficiently so you know what you're selling to your commercial customers. Um, markers that we had left over for years, we could use them over and over because of this marker. So we use this marker to write just the date and the name of whatever the... Um, the seed is, and sometimes we just put new tape on top of the old tape. Um, it just depends on, some of our trays have so much blooming tape on them. And then here's my secret weapon for sowing seeds. Um, so this is an aluminum seed pan. You'll find that on our website too. Um, this is actually a lab pan. This is what scientists use in labs. And why do we use this? Because there's no static electricity. And you may not realize it, I didn't. I would use like, you know how you can buy soft butter in those little shallow plastic dishes. There is so much static electricity in there. You dump your seeds in, you don't know how much you're chasing that seed. In here, there is no resistance. And then when you combine this with a little bit of saliva from your mouth, yes, I spit in the corner of the tray, saliva is far stickier than water is and a toothpick, y'all. That is the secret weapon. We sow thousands of seeds this way, and we're incredibly fast and efficient. Um, so we dump our seeds into here. You don't wanna dump a gazillion seeds in here. You wanna dump them so they scatter a little bit, and you can just, once you have saliva on here, that seed literally, I don't care how tiny it is, jumps on the end of your toothpick and you actually sow it, and we're gonna do that in a minute. Then the rest of the story is this. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> if you're gonna be a seed starter, it's only a matter of time before you have fungus gnats. Fungus gnats are a reality of seed starting. So professionals prevent fungus gnats from the get-go. And the way that we do that is 
these little yellow sticky traps and I don't know if you can see, but there's some on there. This, I just, I leave them even out this time of the year when I had, this is the first time I've started seeds. I leave them in my grow room to catch anything that's a remnant in there. Um, these are sticky traps that attract and stick the adults on. And then the way that we, <clears throat> our program is to prevent, this is natural. That is G-N-A-T-R-O-L. You can find this on our website because you have a hard time finding it in small quantities. Um, I add natural, this is a BT. Um, this, we add, I add natural to my watering can every Wednesday. So that means every soil that's in my grow room is gonna be treated with this larvicide to kill any eggs and larva that the adults have laid in the soil. Um, so this is every Wednesday and then every Monday I put food in my watering can and we are big fans of neptune's harvest the fish and seaweed and you'll find all of these um, on our website if you need them um, but if you make it part of your practice and you don't wait if you wait until you see fungus gnats you've already lost the war people um, you just can't even imagine um, they live in house plant soil they live anywhere that there's moisture um, so you really have to do that all right so I feed once a week, I water every single morning, and your environment needs to be so that if you water thoroughly this morning, when you come out tomorrow morning to water, those soil blocks should be virtually dry because it's the wet to dry cycle in 24 hours that prevents your blocks from growing algae and mold. Y'all, I get the most awful images of soil blocks covered in stuff and it is because they're staying wet all the time. That is, you have to learn your, the fact that our trays that I use do not drain means that you have to pay special attention to not leave water standing in there and that you need to have an air temperature that is drying out your soil blocks, which is like most homes, right? Um, so we sow the seeds. I then, because these are cool flowers, cool season hardy annuals, they go onto a seedling heat mat with a cookie cooling rack between the tray and the heat mat because these seeds still need heat and they need it consistently 24 seven, but they don't need it quite as warm as the soil, um, as the heat mat makes them. They stay on the heat source until you see signs of life in 50 percent of the seeds. If you just see the seed crack and that counts, then they're moved from the heat to a grow light. Grow lights, depending on what kind you have, the kind that we sell and like to use are T8 or T12s. I always get it confused. It's one or the other. They're warm but not hot. T5s will cook your seedlings unless you keep them far away. They're the really skinny ones. Um, the T8 and T12s are give off just enough beneficial warmth that you put it down to about two or three inches above your canopy of your seedlings. That keeps your seedlings short, stocky, and healthy until it's time to, to move them out. And that's all. There's a lot about that on our website. And as the season moves along, we'll talk more about that process. Um, but let's make some soil blocks. So y'all know I'm here by myself, right? So um, you'll just have to bear with me for a second. Let me make sure I have, let me see, I want my tray. I'm gonna turn the camera down so you can actually see into my um, tray here. And I think that is gonna allow you to see, yes. So this is the blocking mix. First off, you notice that I'm starting in a tray um, and I'm gonna pull it back. This tray is actually backwards on this thing. The front of this particular tray is got an opening in the front, but frankly, y'all, you know what I think is a really great tray to use um, is a cat litter box. But you wanna be able, it needs to be big enough that you can get in there and work freely. I dump my soil in, measuring it, like I mentioned, three parts of blocking mix to one part water. Most often, I have to add a little bit of extra water. Um, and it is beneficial, like if you're coming out to work, to go ahead and get your soil in the tray, get the water in and just let it sit and then come, so give it a few minutes to absorb um, and then come mix it all up. And if you still need some, but friends, it's just like concrete. 
So easy to put too much water, so you need to mix it really well. So this is almost perfect. Um, I've left this sitting here for a few minutes and there a little bit of water pooled over here on the side. That's exactly what I kind of like to see. I will tell you that people that have trouble getting the blocks out of the blocker, the soil is not moist enough. Now this is the ready-made soil um, that we have made and you can see there's little bits and pieces in it. That's rock, that's part of what provides the nutrient. And while this has been sifted, which you'll see in the recipe, you have to sift compost and peat moss to do this, um, you're still gonna find little bits and pieces in here. You can't imagine how much debris um, is in compost. And so um, you will see some, but it is minimal. All right, so here's my method of madness. First off, I have more soil in here than I usually like to do because I wanna make some big blocks for you too, so you need more soil. I tend to make a pile as I've just done because you need to have something to drive your blocker into. So the blocker has this plunger and then it has this stationary bar. The stationary bar is what you hold on to. And so I've made my pile. I'm just gonna hold on and I'm just gonna push it down into the mix. Now, because of the moisture in the soil, sometimes the blocker will suction to the base of the, to the tray that you're working in. So I just pull it to the side before I pick it up. I tend to push down twice, just jiggling it. You don't wanna cram pack the chambers, but you surely wanna have firm, nice blocks. This, the smasher also works to use the side to strike off any excess. And so now, placing them on the tray. Um, so three sets of blocks will fit on here. And you know, the way you set them on the tray really sets you up for quick watering or pain in your neck every time you water it. I always try to put the blocks um, to one side of the tray to create the biggest well to water in, which I'll talk about here in just a minute. So you slide under, you're pushing the plunger with the palm of your hand and you're lifting up, lifting up at the same time. Um, it does take a little bit of practice and the good news about soil blocking, it's just like painting a wall, y'all, if you try to do some painting technique. Um, if you screw it up, you can just dump the blocks back in and do it all over again. And this is really quick when you're not talking to people and doing it at the same time, right? And if you find that your blocker gets kind of hard to push, um, stuff can get, that, especially those little pieces of rock that's in our mix, um, can get crammed in there. So I sometimes keep a bucket of water next to me and I'll just swoosh my blocker, not often, just when I need to. All right, so let's make the last one. So I'm pushing it back and forth a couple of times and striking it off with the potato masher. And I'm gonna make the big blocks too, even though I don't have any seeds to actually sow today. We're gonna to plant these with stock here in just a minute. Now, troubles that you can um, have with the blockers, if you're, and this is happening just a little bit, I don't know if you guys can see it. See right here, um, the blocks are lifted on the corner. First off, it, it's not really that big of a problem, but the reason that tends to occur is if I'd have put, you know, if I'd have thought ahead and mixed my mix last night and let it sit overnight so that the product is really absorbed, this is compost, peat moss, and nutrients is all this is. Um, so if you are having trouble getting the blocks out of the blocker, it will lift the edges and the moisture is what the problem is, right? So I wanna just show you how um, you can make so this is the two inch blocker that I was just telling you about. Um, and it has, um, I, we keep the inserts in because I'll tell you that even if I wanna plant a big seed, um, I find that we just try not to um, ch have to change these nipples from the nipple to the blocker insert. So we leave the insert in all the time. And so you're gonna see that this is gonna make a hole um, in the top of the block that you could either drop a big seed in or it could receive a three quarter inch block. And I will tell you friends, 
We absolutely adore growing tomato plants. I mean, we are big tomato eaters here too. Um, soil blocks grow the most amazing roots um, in tomatoes. What happens, soil blocks, what's so amazing about them is your plants do not get root bound. They don't get, they don't hit the wall of a container and start spinning. So the roots grow out to the edges and then they kind of air prune. You're gonna see fuzzy, gorgeous roots that you have never seen before because they've always been covered by that winding. And tomato plants are particularly amazing. We learned that we have better success with our tomatoes being a little bit bigger than we like to grow in the three-quarter inch block. So we start them in the three-quarter, they grow in there for about 10 or 14 days, and then we just drop them into this two-inch block and they are amazing. So let's do this. So you're gonna see that my technique is a little bit different. See how I'm going back and forth? Where the weak spot on the two inches is the two outer end blocks. Sometimes if you don't deliberately be sure that you've um, filled them, they won't have soil in them. So I guess you're realizing just how much soil this thing is gobbling up. Um, you know, especially if you're commercial, it's a whole different. If you're a home gardener, um, the, wait a minute y'all, I'm trying to find a tray to put these on. Um, if you're a home gardener, you know, go for using the two inch block, but as a commercial grower, there's really not much um, good in starting masses of seeds in the two inch. All right, so it's the same thing, y'all. I'm just pushing the plunger with my palm and the suction on these because of the inserts is a little bit longer. It takes a little bit. You just have to be patient for a second. And so oh, look, a golden retriever hair, imagine that. Um, so if you can see, there's these amazing holes right in the middle. So I could either drop a seed in there and then literally I would just grab one of my um, plant markers. It's like a popsicle stick. And just after I sowed my seed, I would just grab a little blob and put it in there and that's it, you're done. So I want to just um, talk. So that's how you make these. And so I'm going to put you back up so we can see each other, right? Without cutting you off. All right. So let's talk about um, one of the most important things I think that people um, forget. They try to, here's the bottom line. Keep your hands off the soil blocks. Um, when the soil blocks are like this, without a plant with a root mass, if you try to handle the blocks, little or big, with your hands, you're gonna destroy the integrity of the block because there's just no mass in there. It's wet soil and you're just gonna compress it. So I do find in the event that for some odd reason, if you need to handle a block, which I don't think you should, then I use um, plant markers to do that, you know, or a popsicle stick or whatever you have. Um, so I wanna talk about, I'm gonna first move this tray and um, we're gonna get ready to sow some seeds. But um, I wanna also talk about, I don't think that's gonna work. Or, we need to talk about watering and then we're gonna sow some seeds. So I've already sown these. This is um, peach straw flowers. Um, so y'all, we could talk for days, right? I mean, it's January, I'm in the mid-Atlantic. My last frost date's not till mid-April. It is way too soon to be starting warm season stuff. Um, one of the things that um, is really great for me, in my opinion, about soil blocks is plants tend to grow faster. They grow faster because there's just, they're in an environment where their roots are getting so much oxygen. Not only that, but you can handle soil blocks much earlier in life than you can when you're using cell packs or plug trays. Because think about this. So if you sow a seed in here within a week, I mean, it, after it germinates, you have this little plant and it's got this massive little root system. You could pick up that block with your finger at that point in time, with your hands at that point in time. You can handle it if you needed to. Think about a plug tray with a cell. The roots have to engulf all of that soil that's just that fluffy, light soil that it needs so water and air can go through. 
The roots have to engulf all of that for you to be able to pop it out. So in addition to soil blocks growing faster, you can handle them earlier. So they go to the garden faster. And just like, you know, six-year-old children learn how to speak French a lot easier than this old 60-year-old person would, um, plants, when they're planted at their optimal size on the younger instead of on the older side, they just hit the ground running. Um, so... You, when you're reading a seed packet or seed instructions for some seed, and it says, you know, six to eight weeks, start at six to eight weeks before you want to plant it, you can typically shave a third of that growing time off um, of the growing time because of soil blocks. When you put them into their great environment of growing like this, starting on a heat mat, then under a great strong grow light for 16 hours a day with an air temperature that is conducive to vegetative growth, which means warmth. We can't really be growing plants out in our garage, even with a heat mat, y'all. It is the air temperature is as important as the soil temperature is. So, um, so you're going to shave a third of the growing time off. Now to water, I literally, here it is right here, actually. I literally yeah. use a plastic watering can with a pour, not a sprinkle. Um, it does have a sprinkle attachment, but this is not what I use it for. Um, and literally, I keep a large tra a kitchen cat trash can size can in my grow room that I keep filled with water. So it's, you know, room temperature usually. Not that that's a big deal, but um, it, the chlorine also evaporates over 24 hours. So like I would go in there this morning, it would be full. I would use that water to water with, um, and then I fill it up before I leave to sit overnight. My grow room only sees me once a day, y'all. Um, I don't have time to hover and be a helicopter plant starter, which is probably the biggest problem that most people have as they stare and worry and wonder and mess with their stuff too much, right? So... I use a watering can and you just gently pour the water into this well in the tray that you have created. I don't pour the water up against the blocks. I typically aim the water up against the edge. And so you will soon learn when at the different stages of um, growth of how much water you put. When they're like this, when they're on the seedling heat mat, I mean, they're going to be dry. Every morning I come out, they're dry. Um, and so I tend to flood the tray a little bit more than I would maybe in some other stages. Um, and what happens for me, because I grow so much or have so many to water, is I go along and pour in what I think is enough water. Go along and flood, flood, flood. You're not floating the blocks, people. Okay, I mean, this is all based on, I get the craziest emails, y'all, or we get lots of emails into the office and DMs from people. So you're putting in water, and then you're going to, I go through and water all my other trays. Well, by the time I'm finished, I come back to the first one. Is there any water left in the tray, or is it bone dry? Did it suck up all the water? So in the instance that there's water left over, if I put too much, I just simply tip the tray gently and pour the water out. If you're in an environment that doesn't have a drain in the middle of your room like I do, have a bucket right there. Soil blocking can 100% when you're careful and deliberate can be done in a spare bedroom without creating a mess. 100% say that, okay? So you just dump off any excess water. You never leave excess water. But if I come back and there's absolutely no water in there, I think, hmm, I bet I didn't water enough. The interior of the middle blocks most likely are not wet. This is the number one struggle. Either overwatering or underwatering is the big problem people have. I want to caution you to be more on the putting a little bit extra water than not enough. So if I come back and there's no water, I think, hmm, I'm going to put just a little bit more and, you know, let it sit for a couple minutes while I do some other task. Come back. The last thing I do before I leave my grow room is put an eyeball on every tray just to make sure there's no standing water. If there is, I just dump it off. I would rather overwater in the first one or two steps and then check it before I leave. Um, I only water once a day. My That grow room is southeast facing with ceiling to almost floor windows. It is It gets up to 95 degrees um, easy, just like a greenhouse does. Um, in the summertime, and I still only have to water once a day because I water thoroughly. 
So when they're at this stage, you'll find they don't need as much water. But once you have vegetative growth going on, um, you just need to be really certain you're watering them thoroughly, right? So um, I lost my list, y'all. Um, so the watering is key. So now I'm gonna turn you back down again, and I'm gonna sew, I've already done these. These are, you can't see them. Um, and you know, y'all, there's just so much to this. I just released a podcast this morning, um, which is actually, the, the series is on YouTube. It's Seed Starting Week One through Five. Um, and the first two weeks are really about stuff. It's not about doing the job. It's about all the things people skip, which are so simple once you figure them out, but it's a key piece. Um, and the other thing is you really need to know, do you cover the soil, the seed with soil or not? Does it need light to germinate or darkness to germinate? You gotta have all that information. So this is um, peach straw flowers um, and it needs light to germinate. So they are just simply sewn firmly on the surface here. Um, and I'm gonna do the same thing with stock that I'm getting ready to actually do. So let's see about, let's get all my stuff here first. So I've already marked, which one is this? Cat's white. Um, I've already made my um, tag to go on the end. I tend to do that first because let me tell you, it is really, really simple to get on a roll um, and forget to do that. So this is the tray I'm gonna sew. I've already got my tape on here. Um, and so I am sewing cat's stock um, stock, which is, and the variety is cats, and the color is white. Um, so we grow, we only sell the same seeds that we actually, um, that I actually grow here on the farm. Some seeds you'll find that are in little glassines, some are in tubes, some are in nothing. It 100% depends on the seed and, you know, how tiny it is, and does it come out of the cracks of the seed packet. So I'm just going to dump these seeds here in to my, there's always one that sticks, right? All right, so y'all, I'm not spitting on the tray on YouTube. My mother would kill me. All right, so um, let me, I need to turn y'all down. Let's get you adjusted so you can really see what I'm doing here. And I'm gonna try to come in, actually, maybe. Hmm. Okay. So I have my seed pan, that's 25 seeds, probably more like 30. We always, we always, our, my rule to our seed packers is um, they always, go over instead of under, you know, if, if there's a question in weighing them. So this is stock. Stock needs light to germinate. And I tend, sorry, y'all, I got to turn this so that, well, I guess that won't work. What happens with soil blocking is so often, these are bigger seeds. Can y'all see that? That's a pretty big seed. Um, so I'll be able to see where I put them. But when you are sowing little tiny seeds, um, on the surface and you can't see where you've sown or not, I always sow seeds in the very same pattern. And then if I get interrupted, like if somebody comes in or the phone rings or something, I stick the toothpick in the last one that I did. And because I always do the same pattern, it's easy to know which way I'm going, right? So I am just pushing it down I have to say that stock is one of those seeds that um, usually has great germination. So I'm just pushing it into the block so it's, it makes contact, right? But I can still see it. Now, if a seed needed to be, um, to have darkness like tomatoes, that means you just push it down deeper into the block so that it's kind of covered and that creates the darkness. So, and the reality is that what I've learned from people, from people that really know, y'all, I'm not an expert on anything. I just know what I need to know to be a commercial flower farmer and do my job, right? 
But one thing I have learned is that most of the seeds, which is really almost, almost all of the seeds that we start are surface sown. It says they need light to germinate, but in fact, what they really need is oxygen. They don't need to be buried under a bunch of um, soil. So I'm just pushing it down. And, you know, because I know we have so many tomato growers, right? And soil blocking works for vegetables, herbs, flowers. It's for any type of any type of seeds you've got. You just adjust the size of the block to accommodate the size of the seed. That looks like a piece of trash. I'm not even sure that's a seed, but we'll keep it. Um, and I don't know if you're noticing, but the seed was in the beginning when it was fresh with saliva was releasing off of my toothpick easier than it is now. But as I said, I am not spitting on YouTube. There's something about saliva. And the aluminum that just makes it really quick. So you can imagine how fast this can go um, when you're not narrating this on YouTube, right? and you're able to spit freely. Now let's talk about other seeds that I use for, for flowers that I use the small block for. Zinnias, marigolds, both of those are pretty big seeds in general. Um, zinnias, which are a huge one, um, zinnias grow beautifully in the small block. We plant them out at two to three weeks old. Um, they're gorgeous. And a zinnia seed looks a lot like a um, arrowhead, you know, when you look at it. And we just point the zinnia, the pointy end of the zinnia seed, down into the block. Because zinnias need, prefer darkness to germinate. They're pretty easy, but they do better. And so by sticking them pointy end in, Sometimes, like I picked up two with that is why what just happened here. Um, you point the pointy end in, which just makes it go down into the block easily, and that, in fact, is considered covering it. I mean, we have started hundreds and hundreds of thousands of zinnias in small blocks. And um, we were always the first one to have zinnia, zinnias at the farmer's market. You know, because the combination of being able to plant them earlier in the stage of life and they're younger, which means they just hit the ground running. And in general, soil blocked plants, when they're planted at a reasonable time, suffer no transplant shock. That means that... Um, They don't, oop, I dropped my seed. I need some more spit, y'all. All right, I just licked the other end of the, because the problem is your toothpick is dirty, right? You want to put it in your mouth, so now I'm using the other end. All right. And so I'm short one seed, but I am not, well, actually, nope, there's one in the corner there. All right, so that's it. So I don't know if you guys can see, but the seeds are firmly seeded there on the surface. And so what I am going to bring you back up a little bit. Oop. This is my dog's grooming table. A little wide. <laughs> All right. So what will happen now is I'm going to take these seedling, these soil blocks with seeds, and put them in my grow room on the cookie cooling racks with a seedling heat mat. Um, and then once 50% of them show signs of life, cracking, you know, because what happens? The reason, um, you know, I mentioned earlier why I use so many different size trays. It is because um, 
you want to fill a tray. You don't want to put more than one variety or color of um, a, a flower on a tray because it is surprising that sometimes even within the same family, like cat's stock has a lot of different colors. I don't know this to be a fact because we are just now adding a bunch of other colors. Um, but the white may sprout quicker than the cherry. And that happens. We see it happening. And so what would happen is if, let's just say that if each set of these blocks was a different um, color. And the, we did find out that the white germinated much quicker than the cherry or the yellow. So these are starting to crack and sprout and need to be moved to the light. And while and you're not sure what to do, but while you're thinking about it and waiting on to see if these are gonna crack tomorrow, these little seedlings already start stretching. Y'all, it doesn't take two hours for a seedling to stretch and reach for light. When seedlings get lanky, and bend and get yellow and just horrible looking, it's because they're stretching and searching for light. Back when I used to travel so much doing um, conferences and, and, and programs, um, which I don't do anymore, um, I would put seedlings, especially if it was in the summer, um, I would pack the car the night before I would leave the next morning. So I would put seedlings, you know, because that was always, we always used to put notes on my steering wheel of my car so I didn't get in the car and leave without the seedlings. Um, and we had to start doing that because if we put the seedlings in the night before um, or the day before when everybody's at work, by the time I got in the car the next morning, just those few hours of light, all of those seedlings are bent, stretched long. They look nothing like their brothers and sisters that were left in the grow room. Um, so that's why you want to be able to just pick up the tray and move it. And as I mentioned earlier, yes, you can use a um, pancake spatula to move, scoop up that set of blocks and move them, but you do mess up the integrity of the blocks. I mean, it's, it's just impossible not to. Um, and so, you know, that's why we choose the trays that we choose. So friends, if you want to learn more about Soul blocking, there are a ton of resources over at thegardenersworkshop.com. Our learning center um, is full. We have, on, we have paid content and we have um, non-paid content. Bits and pieces everywhere. There's blogs, I have podcasts, there's how-to videos. Um, I would love to connect with you. Um, I do three lives a week in addition to this. I do on Wednesdays on Instagram, Ask a Flower Farmer, where I spend 30 minutes I'm doing my best to answer your questions that you submit during that time. Um, and then at 1 o'clock on Wednesdays, this is all Eastern time, 1 o'clock on Wednesdays, I do a live chat on Clubhouse. If you don't know what Clubhouse is, it's just yet another phone app, social media, as if we needed that, right, y'all? But it's really a lot of fun because it's just audio. It's like us talking on the phone together. I do a 15-minute chat, and then you can raise your hand to come up and it's like us talking on the telephone. You can ask me your question about that topic, or there's a way for you to send a message in um, to Jesse, who is um, one of our team members that is my co-host on that. Um, so Clubhouse is a lot of fun. You just have to download it for your phone. Every phone, any phone can get it, and you do not have to have an invitation. You join Clubhouse, then join my club. It's the Flower Farming Club. Um, and then on, it, it kind of moves around depending on the time of year but i do a facebook live typically um i've been doing them on thursday mornings at 11 and i get go out in the garden and we have a look at what's going on um but you know keep if you sign up for my newsletter you'll be in the know about all of that stuff as well as we send out just tons of highlighted content um, any specials that are happening highlight our instructors and their great resources they're writing articles for growing for market they're you know, doing all kinds of webinars and things, and we would just love to share that with you. So you can sign up to get our farm news over at thegardenersworkshop.com. And um, friends, I think that's all that I have to say. And, um, you know, we cater to gardeners and farmers. I started out as a gardener, and here two and a half decades later, um, I'm almost well, I am a, I'm a flower farmer that's on my way. Um, I'm not in high production anymore. We spent eight years squeezing out of my little, my farm is less than three acres at the height of production. An acre and a half of that was in full field production. No crew hooper greenhouses here. Um, and we produce 10 to 15,000 stems of flowers a week in season. 
pretty amazing, actually. Pretty frightening when I look back over what we used to do. And uh, we're just bringing you all of our experiences in a lot of different ways, and we love you coming along with us. And remember, I will answer your questions um, if I didn't answer them already through the course. So friends, till we meet again, ciao.